We're on a mission from God. Wendy? So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad on the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of Monster, or Humanoids from the Deep, on May 16th, 1980. It was written by William Martin, credited as Frederick James, based on a story by Frank Arnold and Martin B. Cohen, Directed by Barbara Peters, with uncredited direction from Jimmy T. Murakami, and released by New World Pictures, which had just released The Private Eyes, and was run at the time by Roger Corman. I apologize in advance for the sexiness of my voice (laughs) today. Getting over something. Joe Dante was Corman's first pick to direct, but he was not interested in the story. Yeah, and that's too bad. I mean, because it's... but this is post Piranha, though. Yeah, it's post Piranha, so I guess you like. But uh, he would go on to work with Rob Boutin later. So. Right. But I, I think it would have it would have been too much retreading of something he had just done. Yeah. The working title was Beneath the Darkness because Corman wanted to trick bigger names into attaching themselves to a classier sounding script. After seeing a cut, Corman demanded that additional scenes with violence and nudity be added. When Peters refused to shoot extra scenes, Corman reached out to Murakami, director of Battle Beyond the Stars, to shoot the scenes uncredited. It's unclear which version we saw because, according to one IMDb trivia point, the reshot humanoid attack scenes were struck from the final print. Right. It seemed like they were in this one. Yeah, there were definitely definitely scenes that seemed out of place or just more rapey. Yes, (laughs) that that don't like. More (laughs) rapey. They don't necessarily like cut cleanly into the film Mm -hmm. like it just felt like they definitely felt added later turkle and peters took efforts to have their names removed from the film but they were refused Uh, this was the second feature film score for composer james horner yeah after john sales the lady in red in 79 and he will be back later this year for battle beyond the stars with murakami Uh, horner wrote the score for this film in two weeks Uh, Obviously, Horner quickly rose to the top of his profession and worked pretty consistently on massive budget tentpole stuff right up until his untimely death in 2015 when he crashed his private plane in Los Padres National Forest shortly after taking off from Camarillo Airport right down the street. More hints as to where we live. (laughs) Stop telling people where we live. (laughs) We'll talk more about his composer credits after we cover the film. Uh, The budget for this was two and a half million dollars. The monster costumes were the work of Ghost Blake himself, Rob Bottin. What we watched was the Shout Factory 30th anniversary Blu-ray with the on-screen title Monster and very, very small text that read Humanoids from the Deep. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, we don't want to be associated with this title, but legally we're obliged. Right. I I feel like there's no way you'd be able to read those letters on a DVD. This had to be the Blu-ray. Which I think makes this the European version, because that's what the Shout Factory release was. But also, wouldn't it be Monsters? I, I, just, I just think it's weird that it's called Monster, like singular. Because like there is more than one. Yeah. That's, Spoiler alert. That is odd. I didn't even think about that. Uh, a remake was produced for Showtime in 1996, starring Robert Carradine, Emma Sams, and Clint Howard. Robert Carradine will show up again in our next film. Yeah. Uh, a sequel was planned and set to be released in 1991 by producer Menahem Golan of Golan Globus. But the project never fully materialized, sadly. What is it about this film that everyone wants to keep remaking? (laughs) Um, That's a silly question, Richard. I'm (laughs) not sure if you watched it. Uh, The film was also the debut feature of comedian ventriloquist David Strassman. (laughs) But yeah, we start with uh, the word monster appearing over the beach with humanoids from the deep underneath it. And we get random shots of this seaside town as people are working on the docks and a bunch of guys are chatting near their ships until Johnny Eagle shows up and Hank Slattery hits him with a you people right away. <laughs> and progress means money. See, you and your people, you don't understand that. Hank Slattery is this... Uh, you don't understand he's from the U Indian tribe? 
And so it's actually oh, yeah. that was very respectful. He's, he's very, no. the, the you people. Oh, that's actually nice no. then. No, that's not true. No, that's not the case. <laughs> Hank Slattery is the Vic Morrow character. Yeah. He'll be kind of a bully throughout the film, and uh, Johnny Eagle here is actually a Mexican American actor playing mm-hmm. a Native American, which I think was done a lot. Yeah. yeah, but there were also plenty of working Native American actors. Yeah. All of them wanting to be in monster humanoids from the deep, I'm sure. Yeah, well, of course. I, I want to be in this movie. <laughs> they have these weird back and forths where Vic says something to antagonize him. Uh, the Hank character says something mm-hmm. to antagonize Johnny. And he says, yeah, that's what Custer said. And yeah. He says, hey, well, we lost the battle, but we won the war. Like, we sure killed all of your people. <laughs> I, it was also very confusing because there appears to be more than one character named Hank. Oh really? Um, so Vic Morrow is credited as Hank Slattery. Yeah. But the the they keep calling the sheriff Hank. Oh, interesting. And and I was like, S- who's Hank? <laughs> when they keep yelling Hank, it's like you can't have two characters with the same name. Don't yeah. do that. It's like no, this is based on a true story. They can't just change the names <laughs> willy nilly <laughs> to protect the innocent. <laughs> yeah. Some of the fishermen head out. N- not the main character Jim or Hank, but a third a set third, of people. Yeah. Um, head out to catch something. An expendable something. set of people. Yes, <laughs> let's say that. Uh, they catch something very big in their net right away, but it turns out that uh, the kid on the boat forgot to refuel the motor to reel it in, and they decide that they're going to try and drag it with the boat until it wears out. Well, well first they have the kid. I, I want to go out on record here. I believe the kid is equally responsible for the deaths of these people. <laughs> yes. Yeah, for multiple reasons. <laughs> so he doesn't fill the winch. Which forces them to, to pull it in by hand. But while he's attempting to put fuel in the winch, he knocks over the gas can and just leaves it. Yeah, so it's just pouring gas all over the deck of the ship. Yeah. And the pump is also out, so they can't they can't pull the catch in because they're... Yeah, they're, the engine's they're, not working. Yeah. And the kid falls overboard because his dad keeps saying, no, get further over the edge, son. <laughs> further, further and further <laughs> until the kid falls off. You're in too far. <laughs> yeah, and then he just, like, you get the standard monster movie eruption of blood from the surface of the water. Yeah. And the other guy on the ship is keeping this dad from diving in after his son. But it, he saves his life for a grand total of three seconds. Yeah, when a guy comes running out with a flare gun and he just launches it into the deck. Yeah, he just fires it at the puddle of gas on the ship. <laughs> And uh, the whole thing just explodes in a hellacious ball of fire. Uh, Jim sees it from his boat, and he's watching through binoculars, and he says, I don't see anyone in the water, so uh, I guess we call uh, call the authorities. Yeah. But uh, I'm not expecting any survivors here. The cops speak with Jim at his home about the explosion and s- seem to already be blaming Johnny Eagle for this. Yeah, or, or they're blaming somebody. They're very quick to, like... Say, yeah, they, they suspect foul play immediately. Well, there was gasoline all over the deck of this boat. <laughs> yeah, right. But I, first of all, I doubt they know that right now because that that boat probably sank and they haven't even gotten it out of the water, I would mm-hmm. bet. And then secondly, like unless there's like a motive in play, I don't know why they would just go, well, it's got to be the Native American guy in town, right? <laughs> but uh, The only one who's against the cannery. Like that, 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 that's the big plot point of this movie is that they're building right. a, going to build a cannery. Which Hanco is going to build yeah. a cannery? So and they're and they're upset about that. It's going to cause there to be even less fish. Is like, is that how cannery works? Is like, do they just? I thought they fish? just provide the packaging. Yeah. Do they, <laughs> do they do they take all the fish in the area? Well, I think the the anticipation is that they're going to fish more to supply the cannery. Ah. And then there will be less for everyone. I, I just keep picturing the the Mr. Burns Omni Net. Coming from the Burns, like, <laughs> slurry factory. Yeah. But they seem to be having some sort of ecological problem with the number of fish in the town anyways. Already, yeah. Because, yeah, they, they keep complaining that they're not getting fish. Right. And, and later, I think he pulls up one when he wasn't trying to. Yeah. And, and we're, we're supposed to assume that the reason the fish are not around is because of these creatures, right? Right. I think so. Jim's dog is barking a lot while the cops are there, and so he just lets it outside to chase whatever it's barking about yeah that's uh, that's a smart thing to do with your right. dog we've seen multiple dogs already in this movie just wandering in the street yeah so it seems like this town is very uh, laissez-faire with their their dog rules but uh the dog wanders off and is attacked by something and we just see the attack in pov the next day jim and his wife 
uh, wander the beach to try and find it because the dog didn't come home all night and they find its mangled corpse just tied up in a, a bunch of seaweed on the beach. Yeah, so this was the first indication to me that this was Rob Bottin's work. Right. Because I was like, man, that looks like right out of the thing. Yep. Like the, the mangled dog corpse. And so I had to look it up. It's like, yeah, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's his work. He got the practice from it. So the next day, all the dogs are dead except for Johnny's. For some reason, are the monsters framing Johnny Eagle for this? <laughs> <laughs> they are very upset. I don't know what the... It, it doesn't seem like they'd have to work very hard to frame him. They're already after this guy for the boat murder. Or maybe the point is just that he's the only responsible dog owner and he just kept it in all night. But either way, everyone's dog is dead except for Johnny's. And uh, Hank Slattery takes notice of this. A woman in lingerie hears a noise outside of her home. And she wanders around the house making random sounds and scaring herself. Yeah. This really bothered me. She's literally getting ready for bed or something or somebody's coming over. Whatever is happening, she's doing it in front of a glass door. Like a, yeah. a, a wide open glass pane of door and it's like brightly lit inside. I'm just like, who changes into lingerie in front of a glass door? But she is changing into lingerie. Yeah. And when she answers the phone later, she was fully expecting someone to co- come over. Yeah. She's like, oh yeah, I'm ready whenever you were going to come over. I don't know what time and it's like what what are they implying about the relationship between her and linda who is coming over later? Oh, it's just, it's a... but isn't this jim's wife no no it's no not, no, no. Oh, it's this just is, a different this one is... the house looks similar but then, yeah. but then a guy does come over right who is her presumably boyfriend or whatever yeah. and he's like oh linda and i forget the guy's name linda and tom, tom and linda. are coming over yeah, yeah mm. that's it tom but i just think that's weird it's like you're putting on lingerie when your friend tom and linda and your boyfriend are coming over to have yeah. a lovely evening together yeah <laughs> yeah there's a lot of throwaway like names that i can't remember whose faces they go to like peggy denise linda <laughs> i was like okay i know i think all of these girls die but uh but uh, peggy it's unclear yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but it's uh i can't keep everyone straight so i don't remember who this is the big crazy thing that happened to me in this scene is when she's walking through her house yes and a dress falls off a hanger but it makes a knife unsheathed oh, yes. sound yes <laughs> or like what a is sword that dress made out of? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense at all and she she keeps scaring herself and it's no fault of the monsters because she like leans on a door and it squeaks or this metal shirt falls off of the hanger <laughs> or like she bumps the plates in the, the di- dish in the, yeah. in the sink and like they all rattle and she keeps freaking herself out but the monster's not doing any of this she's just freaking herself out in her house but yeah we both looked at each other like what's that shirt made out of <laughs> but the phone rings and, and linda's headed over um the score here while she's wandering around her house sounds a lot like house of cards to me mm. but i looked it up and it's not it's not a horner score that's jeff beale for that show so um he stole it from this is what i'm saying okay <laughs> um then the guy surprises her and she almost stabs him with like this big fork that she picked up in the kitchen while she was freaking herself out uh, everyone in town is arriving at an old-fashioned dance yeah and uh, a hootenanny a hootenanny there you go <laughs> uh a couple is flirting in the parking lot and the mayor stands up in front of everyone and introduces some Canco executives and uh, their resident scientist, Dr. Susan Drake. Who who couldn't look less excited to be there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they are opening a cannery and promise that, uh, in spite of everyone's fears, that they will actually be providing bigger, faster, and twice as plentiful fish in the area. Uh, the couple outside have now uh, started having sex in a car. Johnny enters... The dance carrying his dog, which is dead, presumably at, at Hank Slattery's hands. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, I thought it implied that the monster finally got around to killing it. No, I think no. Hank killed it uh, as revenge for him killing everyone else's dogs. Oh. And a fight ensues and ends up spilling out into the parking lot. Uh, the cop in town fires a gun in the air to break the fight up. Eventually. Yes. Like, he, he lets it go on for a long time. Yeah, and we, the when the two people start having sex in the car, it's played off like, oh, these ones are going to get killed by a monster. Well, no, they're still in the car having sex when there's a fight going on. And yeah. when people are bumping into the car, it's like shaking while they're having sex. Well, and then he opens up the back of the, the windscreen uh, and get, gets punched back into the yeah. car, like in a slapsticky moment. Yeah. The, the sheriff here, or the, the cop, the main cop character that we keep seeing, he looks like a cross between Clancy Brown and Jim Varney to me. Mm. But, uh, yeah, I, I was trying to figure out who he reminded me of, but uh, it would be neither of those. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, he, well, a lot of the people reading the lines are kind of like all over the place with their either being really too flat or really too 
attempting to be invested in it. Yeah. Uh, but he was pretty much always just out of it, it seemed. Yeah. The next day, we see Hank taking his boat downstream to spy on Johnny Eagle. Um, just like a, as a preventative measure, I guess, he just occasionally spies on people who he hates in case mm-hmm. they're planning on suing him like this one is. But Johnny Eagle is going to sue the cannery because his people have been granted fishing rights by a bunch of government contracts and mm-hmm. they're not being upheld. What? The government's not honoring an Indian tree? <laughs> That's crazy. What are the chances? Um, he seems to be the only one left of his people. Is that, does that seem to be the case? Yeah, he's like the, the, the Native American in Nothing Personal, where he's just like everybody else got massacred. And he's like, I just want to fish. Can I just fish? A girl and another couple sit down on a beach. And uh, the couple starts making out, and then eventually they get up and walk away. Well, because they're just being totally gawked at by... Well, that's their friend, though, right? Third wheel, man. Seems like they're there together. Yeah, but... You don't invite your friend if you don't want your friend to watch. (laughs) But they clearly didn't want their friend to watch, because the moment they saw she was watching, they're all, let's get out of here. I guess. Maybe they didn't know the rules. But they walk past (laughs) this big, like, Godzilla footprint in the sand. Yeah. Um, But it's just by itself, like... Yeah, just just one singular footprint. Yeah, because apparently Jesus carried it the rest of the way. <laughs> We're cutting back and forth yeah. from the beach to uh, the ship where uh, Jim and his brother and another old man yeah. and the doctor are going out to investigate the waters. Um, yeah, the, the, the ADR for this scene is really bizarre. Right, but the, the old man is trying to catch a fish and he's like, it's mine, I got one! And he's freaking out. And uh, Jim... Uh, uh, Mr. Borden is the older man's name. And Mr. Borden uh, is trying to reel in this big catch, but he can't pull it in. And he's like, it's a monster! Just because it's really big. Mm-hmm. And as a reference to the title. And then the wannabe Mark Hamill character is like coaching him on how to fish, even though he's like 40 years younger than him and they live in a fishing town together. Yeah. And, but, he, and he gets like a little too, I guess, familiar. He calls him by his first name and then he corrects himself. Yeah. And I was like, I don't... I don't think that that's probably a big deal unless you're trying to hide that you guys are having some kind of relationship. Yeah. <laughs> but this is Jim's brother, the the Mark Hamill looking kid. Right, right. And the doctor leans over the edge of the boat and starts taking a bunch of pictures of the water. And then when she comes back, Jim's like, oh, would you get some pictures of it? And she's like, I don't know. I, this isn't a digital camera. Those don't exist yet. So <laughs> I'll tell you later what I got pictures of. I have no idea. Like I was just taking pictures of the ocean. I, I was waiting for this to come back, and it never no, does. It's never not like they developed develop it, and they're like, oh, my God, there's something out there. Yeah. yeah I, well, because she's in on it. Yeah. Well, sort of. Uh, but she also doesn't know what she got a picture of, because yeah. we see the, the cameras pointed at the water at the same time as she's taking the pictures. I, 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 feel, I feel at this point I was even kind of like she's completely aware of, what she, of what's going on. Yeah. I mean, and, I got that impression right from the get-go when she's getting introduced at the dance that it's like, all three of these people are supposed to be the, the bad people that are ruining the town. We cut back to the couple on the beach. They have now romped into the water and are roughhousing. Jerry, the man here, is killed. And then he surfaces with like a half-eaten face. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. Yeah, the makeup is great. And uh, the girl starts freaking out. And then she gets dragged down the beach and then stripped and then raped. Mm-hmm. Which um, I think is all part of the Murakami extra footage of uh, people getting stripped and raped over the course of this film. The other girl that was by herself, Linda, just leaves the beach. She's like, all right, I guess I'm going to go home now. Like someone calls to her from the top of the cliff and she's like, I'm not going to wait for my friends to come back. Yeah, I'm sure they're probably fine. (laughs) Yeah. Hank tells the boys, the bad guys, that Johnny intends to sue for fishing rights. And so they decide that they're going to formulate a plan to prevent that. Uh, We get this POV shot approaching a tent that's been set up on the beach. And we hear a girl's voice say, let's see some skin or the guy says let's see some skin and the girl says nothing comes off till i see it okay how's this oh come on show me more than the head (laughs) and then we cut inside the tent where a dummy's head is peeking out of the top of a duffel bag (laughs) and the girl strips completely nude um and the puppet is flirting I mean, with her i know that they're trying to be you know funny here and and sneaky but like even if you take the dummy out of it like or or you put the dummy back into it that's a weird thing to say it's just like i'm not gonna have sex with you until you show me your dummy. yeah i gotta see all of this <laughs> yeah. 
it's it's her thing. Yeah. And she immediately takes off all of her clothes. Yeah, no, she honors the <laughs> contract she set. Um, and then the puppet's like, Hey, honey, want to see my woodpecker? Will I get splinters? Don't worry, baby, I've been sanded. But then the guy drops the dummy to have sex with her. When the monster enters the tent. Yeah. And the dummy's eyes turn to look at the <laughs> tent opening. <laughs> Which is amazing. I love that they included that the dummy is a real sentient creature right. in this movie. Um, it turns out, though, that this is a famous ventriloquist and that uh, part of his gimmick was that he had remote controls that would cause the puppet to do things when he walked away from it. Mm. Ah. Uh, so maybe that's what happened or maybe this puppet is alive. Maybe it's a Goosebumps situation. But either way, the, the monster is attacking... And the dummy takes the time to, like, do a double take. Yes. <laughs> um, the guy gets his back completely torn open, and then the girl runs out of the tent completely naked um, and is chased for a while before she's raped again on the beach. This is not, like, the same girl that got raped. But no, no, again, no, we are seeing a person raped. I forget what the characters' names are, but... This is Tommy um, and Denise, I think. Tommy and Denise. So Tommy is the Mark Hamill-looking kid? Yeah. Okay, Tommy and Denise and Johnny pull up to his cabin on a boat... Um, and they were all going to have dinner together. But for some reason, as soon as they get there, Johnny's like, oh, you can borrow my truck if you need to ride back into town. And it's like, no, the plan was that we were all going to talk and eat. Yeah. You talked about, you, the real whole reason we're here was that you, you said you caught some steelhead. Yeah. And we're like, oh, okay, let's let's take your boat. And then. That's you, like if right when Richard got here, we were like, so anyway, you, if you want to leave, go ahead. And it's like, well, no, I'm here to talk about humanoids. Um. <laughs> you never offered that. To me, though, I would have liked to have left. <laughs> <laughs> but now you see why I didn't offer it. But uh, it's funny because you pointed this out, Jess. Uh, he says, we came here to talk and eat. And she says, and I make great cornbread. And he said, great, let's clean some fish then. <laughs> like, How do you make cornbread? <laughs> what is your recipe? <laughs> this is so strange. Um, Everything involves fish in this yeah. town. <laughs> but before they can even get started, yeah, it's like... Uh, uh, chew and swallow falls <laughs> it's just everything has fish in it mm-hmm. every single meal the bad guys pull up in a boat and throw a bomb into johnny's home uh, one of them is very hesitant to do it he's like i don't like this and the other guy's yeah. like shut up susan <laughs> <laughs> then they throw the they throw the bomb and then you hear something like i guess actually this must be a little bit later because the girl goes cornbread and then the house explodes <laughs> Um, Every damn time, Denise. But then just by sheer coincidence, I guess, the monsters attack Mark Hamill on the docks here. And I keep calling him that, but this is not Mark Hamill. It's just an actor. I forget his name. And uh, the house is still burning on the hill. The woman took the truck because she's going to go to town to get help. Right. And Johnny's trying to fight the fire himself. But right now, uh, what is his name? Sorry, Danny? Billy? The one who's being attacked? Yes. Tommy. Tommy. (laughs) I knew it was one of those E's. They seem to name everybody in this film unnecessarily. Like yeah. there's a lot there's a lot of people that just get killed and you're like, Yeah, we didn't we never really needed to know their name. Yeah. But uh Sammy here, uh or Jimmy well, Tommy. Tommy <laughs> gets uh he gets attacked on the docks until it seems like Johnny Eagle notices it's going on and starts firing at the monster. Creature, yeah. Uh, We cut back to the girl driving the truck into town when a monster attacks from the car roof. Like, she didn't notice it was on the roof when she got in it. Or maybe it was in the bed of the truck, I guess. Yeah, and climbed up onto the roof. But it's attacking her through the front. Right. But she shakes it off of the car and then runs it over. And it just sounds like she's running over a paper bag. It just, like, crinkles. (laughs) It was like a bag of chips. Yeah. just crunched a bag of chips. It was like uh, the Fritos from Ninth Configuration. (laughs) And then, right when she thinks she's safe, a second monster attacks through the back window. And she just drives off a bridge. Yeah. And the car lands upside down at like in like a shallow ravine and explodes the second it hits the ground. Um, Johnny brings uh, Lemmy's body. What's his name? <laughs> <laughs> I know you know it now. No, I actually don't know it. But it's Tommy. <laughs> Tommy. Uh, Johnny brings Tommy's body to town in a boat. And immediately they're like, you're going to have to explain yourself, Johnny. Like, <laughs> why would I? This guy's clearly been attacked by a monster. He has claw marks all over him. Why would I bring back the body? Yeah. And this guy's like one of my good friends who just came to have dinner with me. But they they don't give him any benefit of the doubt. And uh, they immediately assume, oh, you clawed him to death? Why did you do that, Johnny? 
And, is this uh, Tom the same as the, is this Tommy the same as the Tom and Linda character? Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. Um, and he gets rushed off to the hospital here. Jim and Johnny and the doctor uh, decide they're going to go hunting for these monsters. And uh, while they're fishing, somehow they mistake a tiny salmon for a full size monster. Mm-hmm. Like they're reeling it in, and they're like, "Oh my god, here it comes, here it comes!" And they pull it up, and it's just a fish. And they're like, "Oh, I never thought I'd be disappointed to reel in a fish." And it's like. You thought this was a human-sized thing when you were pulling it out? The doctor says that it is bigger than a normal salmon and that that's a sign that the monsters are probably close, which is another hint that she knows a little bit more than she's letting on. They do eventually find a pod of monsters outside these natural caves. Just hanging out on the beach. Yeah. It seems like they're sleeping because she's already made the determination that they are nocturnal hunters. Mm -hmm. So they find them and they're like, just wake them up like, hey, hey, it's time to get up. It's time to get up. And then the monsters try to kill them. So they shoot all the monsters. And then they end up finding under like a big lump of seaweed one of the rape victims who is apparently still alive. And they bring her home and they also take the dead monster to the laboratory at Canco. Which has a laboratory. I don't think a cannery company should have a lab. That's for all the GMO fish that they're trying to make. Edwards, one of the other people that works at Canco, tells them... That uh, they can all go home and Kanko's going to investigate themselves. Don't, don't yeah. worry about it. We're going to take care of this. <laughs> and the doctor says, I warned you that this was going to happen. And I also haven't told any of these fine people here. But that ends now. So go and string up the uh, the presentation. Because we're going to tell them exactly what we're <laughs> doing here. And we, we get a little film strip of the DNA5 experiment. Where they're injecting frogs, I think, to start with dna5 which makes yeah. them reach adulthood faster so as a result they are reproducing faster and evolving faster meanwhile michael Crichton's going hmm, yeah frogs. hello john hello john um i want to know what happened to dna one through four i mean i pre- well, i presume dna no, one yeah. is just what's in regular creatures yeah so <laughs> the said the first one that they developed they called dna2 that's possible but she suspects that because they had some kind of a mistake happen where a bunch of DNA5 creatures were released into the wild accidentally, that the DNA5 by itself may have latched onto other species, including the uh, koalacanth, I think she calls it. But the monsters are basically evolving into a humanoid form, and they intend to procreate with humans now. Mm-hmm. And then Jim goes, oh my god, the salmon festival. <laughs> And we cut to the Salmon Festival, where radio DJ Madman Mike Michaels from K-Fish is broadcasting live with Miss Salmon, Sandy. Sandy and, Salmon. But he keeps calling her Salmon, because he likes to pronounce the L, the hard L in Salmon. It's just Salmon, Mike. Don't worry about it. <laughs> the mayor asks for the band that's playing at the festival to pick it up with some faster music like Tarara Boomdie, which I think... Even in the 1900s, uh, we had a character make fun of it for being a boring song. <laughs> but uh, the band gets mad at him, and they're like, no, we're, we're playing the classics. And he's like, just make it more exciting. We don't want people to leave. This is a salmon festival. We don't have a lot. <laughs> it's been a terrible fishing year, too. So. <laughs> but it's also like, you guys live in the middle of nowhere. It's just a fishing town. Like No one's going to leave the only thing to do in town. The bad guys show up to the festival. And uh, they call the monster hunt a wild goose chase because they think it's all made up and that Johnny just slashed his good friend to death. They assume Johnny's out having sex with a buffalo right at this moment. Yeah. Uh, He's probably out there making it with a buffalo. (laughs) And the good guys show up with a monster body and they just dump it on the docks and they're like, hey, look, we weren't making it up. Here's a monster body. We have no idea how many there are out here. And then one bursts out of the docks right here. (laughs) And a riot breaks out. A girl on roller skates is attacked presumably stripped though we don't see the whole attack yeah yeah there people seem to be running just back and forth yeah nobody's leaving (laughs) (laughs) because they keep showing cutaways of people trying to exit the dock yeah it was like there's still people on the dock like 10 minutes later it's like why how long is this dock yeah and also it was clear when they brought the body in there was only like four people on the dock and we've seen like five people try and cross the dock and it still has like 10 people on it but the radio dj starts reporting the frenzy on the radio we cut to jim's house where his wife is taking a shower she just put her baby in a playpen 
but she can't hear the radio program yet, but she will be hearing it soon. Uh, one of the humanoids rips a dude's whole head off. Yeah. That was it's pretty a pretty good. awesome shot. There's just, uh, Botine's gore is outrageous. Mm-hmm. It's like him and Savini are like the kings of that. The DJ tries to protect Miss Salmon, and uh, he gets his rib cage torn completely open. Like, it almost looks like, I mean, I'm sure it was just a tearaway part of the shirt, and then with rib cage, like, yeah. made up on his chest. But it looks like he didn't have skin there in the first place. <laughs> it's just like, oh no, you revealed my bones! <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. I feel like uh, the DJ and Miss Salmon get what they deserve here, because we've cut back and forth to them in this tent, like five times already yeah. and they've just been staying there when everybody else mm-hmm. is true. running and screaming and trying well, to flee and they just been staying there well it's like the the lady in the fog at the on the radio you mm-hmm. have to report on it you're it's your duty as a journalist to yeah, stay but miss salmon didn't need to be there right she miss salmon the i agree she gets everything she deserved well no she she is <laughs> she is a political figure and she is <laughs> she was elected miss salmon <laughs> she, is, she has a duty she does not want to incite panic <laughs> yeah because i'm gonna just keep hanging out and having fun at the party until miss salmon says it's time to go home like for example i'll just stay on the carousel even if there's monsters running in circles around <laughs> and, it and corpses yeah there's literally dead bodies riding a carousel around but actually like the dj i was impressed with how much he does to try and protect her like it, the typical joke in a horror movie is that as soon as the monster gets that close that this guy's just going to run off because he's all mouth and he's not actually mm-hmm. but he keeps her behind him the whole time and he's like trying to like one-on-one fist fight with this monster and then they my bones we reveal his bones <laughs> the uh, one of the kids at the festival like throws like a flaming torch <laughs> over a humanoid i don't know where he got this maybe it was like a prize at one of the games <laughs> And uh, it goes right over a humanoid, but just close enough to light the whole thing on fire. Yeah. This had to be like the last shot of the movie because they were like, okay, we only have one suit that fits like a full person. Well, I, what, he, what I'm guessing is that this is one of the creatures that came out of the water while they're pouring gasoline all oh, over okay. the surface. So it maybe it maybe it had residual gasoline on it, but... <laughs> The balls on this kid to just run up with a flaming tiki torch and yeah. just hurl at it. Yeah. But uh, the humanoid completely catches fire and has to jump off into the water. And the kid goes and he grabs Hank and he drags him to his sister who is trapped on the docks where the docks have collapsed. Mm-hmm. She's unable to climb up to safety. And Hank is very bad at helping. Yeah. Uh, he like <laughs> goes up to the edge, but he refuses to get any closer to this girl. And it's like. He's like, no, just reach further. No, just have a longer arm. <laughs> I'm not going to lay down on the dock. This is a new sweater. Yeah. <laughs> so he refuses to help her until it gets real close. Uh, Tommy shoots the monster because Hank is not helping. And the monster keels over and rolls back into the water. But then a second monster starts to come up. So uh, Hank finally decides, okay, I'm going to do this for real now. And he jumps off. He gets under the girl and starts pushing her up from below when another humanoid grabs his leg and it looks like he's about to get killed but then tommy he waits long enough for the monster to bite hank yeah he's like you deserve to lose at least a foot over this <laughs> and then he shoots the monster and kills it and helps hank back up onto the dock at this point like you said the doctor and jim are pouring a bunch of gas into the water and then they light it on fire unclear how this is going to help anything or yeah. anyone at all because yeah, yeah. all the monsters are on land killing people already yeah we get so many cutaways of just monsters attacking people and ro- ro- roaming through the crowds and crashing into things yeah but uh it turns out that these monsters are actually pretty fragile and the crowd is able to kill them handily by just picking up sticks and smacking them in the head yeah um and then like a group of people like surround one and bash it to the ground well, they are just like giant fish yeah so and their brains are exposed yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, while this is all happening humanoids have broken into jim's home his wife picked up the baby and tossed it into a closet real quick um, and then starts running around the house with a butcher knife when she gets cornered in the kitchen she pours drain cleaner over the head of the fish and then stabs it to death yeah but she successfully on her own kills this thing mm-hmm. jim busts in just too late to save her but yeah early enough still to almost get stabbed himself by freaking her out and kicking the front door open instead of just using a key i guess she barricaded or something yeah yeah. she kind of reminds me of the mom in gremlins yes uh when like the mom is dealing with it in the kitchen and it just throws the one into the microwave yeah and then the whole the whole set explodes 
or no, that's in the second one where the where the gremlins put all the pots in the microwave. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. But yeah, so Jim busts in. She almost stabs him, but then they hug, and he's like, "Where's the baby?" And she's like, "Oh, he's in the closet. It's fine." The next morning, we see the aftermath of the salmon festival. There's weird pink smoke coming out of the carousel. Did you see that? Uh, I did. I did not. It's but... just like gushing colored smoke, and it's really weird. It is really weird. That twelve hours later, the carousel would still be smoking if it never even caught fire. Right, and why is it pink? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Hank says that the doctor is back at her lab. When Jim's like, "Oh, where'd she go? Did she die or something?" I I just left. Yeah. And and so we cut to the lab where Peggy, the uh, victim that they they found still conscious on the beach yeah, and the only victim because we did see other people that like the ventriloquist girl was never recovered right yeah not yet anyway yeah but this uh this victim is now pregnant and gives birth through her chest to a half humanoid baby but she also like is undergoing changes herself yeah her pupils change color and yeah. everything and then the title comes back and we get monster humanoids from the deep again and that's the end of the film i thought it was pretty cool yeah, I mean, I, I I feel like I like this more than it should, only because I needed a palate cleanser. Yeah, <laughs> from all the movies we've been watching. Yeah, been we had a couple bad ones in a row, but uh, yeah, this one was pretty great. The special effects are amazing because Botine knows what he's doing. The score is good. I mean, it's early for Horner, but it's still pretty solid throughout. And uh, I like a good corny sci-fi movie. I feel like my dad would love this movie if I put it on for him. Yeah, he'd fall asleep to this one. Yeah, he would sure. love the first half, though. <laughs> this was directed by Barbara Peters, we said before. This was her last feature because she probably was pissed off enough about having someone come in and direct extra scenes that she was like, I'm going to go back to TV where people let you direct your show and they don't come and edit it after you. So she worked on mostly TV through 86 when she had her last director credit. Uh, the other director, Jimmy T. Murakami, Obviously, we said later in 1980, he'll right. come back for Battle Beyond the Stars. He also directed Heavy Metal, which is a crazy movie. Yeah. Is that the animated one? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. He also directed a 2001 animated Christmas Carol starring Simon Cowell as Scrooge. Okay. So that sounds awful. It was written by Frederick James. I said before he was using a pseudonym for it. Uh, his only other writing credit is for a docu-series called American Experience in 1992. He did one episode of that. But... That was it for this guy. Mm -hmm. The composer, we said, was James Horner, um, who comes back with Murakami to do Battle Beyond the Stars. But he's done so many huge things. Uh, Star Trek II, Crawl, Cocoon, Commando, Aliens, An American Tale, Willow, Land Before Time, Field of Dreams, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, Rocketeer, Braveheart, Casper, Apollo 13, Jumanji. And he won Oscars for Best Music and Best Original Song for Titanic. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, he's your favorite composer right richard he's not my favorite composer no john oh. williams probably right oh uh, i usually go jerry goldsmith oh uh, okay uh but he's he's among my favorites okay. i'm not the friend i thought i was richard <laughs> unacceptable doug mcclure was jim hill um he will play the slapper in cannonball run 2 um he's also mayor kyle applegate in 87 episodes of out of this world that's the one with the oh i remember the, the talking pile of sugar cubes diamond cube thing yeah. with her dad inside I know. um Anne Turkle was Dr. Susan Drake. She has mostly TV credits. She was married to Dumbledore at the time. Uh, the first Dumbledore, Richard Harris. Okay. <laughs> I need some clarification on yes. that Dumbledore. Which Dumbledore, please? This was her first film that he was not in, Richard Harris. Vic Morrow was Hank Slattery. He was obviously the coach in, for the opposing team in Bad News Bears. Mm-hmm. He's a villain of Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry. He was on the TV series Combat. And as most people know, he died on the set of the Twilight Zone movie. Yeah. Which we'll be getting into when we get to that one but it was a crazy i mean look up the story we won't, yeah. we won't go into it but look up the story but don't about google that. the video of it because oh, that god. exists too oh god i didn't know that anthony pena played johnny eagle he was valdez in running man he was also elias in the last stand and hector lopez in bitter harvest those last two were macgyver episodes <laughs> uh dennis galick De- <laughs> denise denise galick <laughs> <laughs> wait it, am I pronouncing the last name right though? Gaelic Ga- or, Ga- or Gaelic? Gaelic, maybe it's G A L I K. Denise Gaelic played Linda Beale, who played Lisa in Don't Answer the Phone, which is the woman who was threatening to jump off the building before the cop came and like negged her off the ledge. Like <laughs> you're an idiot, get down. David Strassman played Billy, that is the ventriloquist character. 
who is a legitimate ventriloquist who still works to this day. And the puppet, if you're interested, is named Chuck Wood. <laughs> How original. Greg Travis played Mike Michaels, the radio announcer. Um, he played a net transponder in Starship Troopers. Yeah, he is. He is. The guy is like, it's a dirty planet, a bug planet. Like he's like, <laughs> and he's like, he like the, it's because he, he opens the movie. Yeah. Because it's the battlefield and he gets immediately like Casper Van Dien is trying to get him away. Yeah. And he gets, he gets killed by the, one of the bugs. Um, he also played Andy Warhol in The Watchmen. Oh. Um, and uh, he came back for the 1996 TV movie of this. I hope it's the same character, but I could not find it. I tried so hard to find right, the TV right. movie. Phil Newkirk in Showgirls and Showgirls 2 which I didn't even realize there was a sequel or that any characters from the first one came back, but Greg Travis managed. Uh, Linda Shane played Sandy, Miss Salmon. Uh, she directed the Purple People Eater movie <laughs> and a couple episodes of Alex Mack, and she wrote Screwballs with Jim Wynorski. Yeah. Rob Bottin played the humanoid in addition to doing a lot of the makeup. The humanoid. There the was the one with the long arms. Because <laughs> there were... There were like three different models. There was one that they only had half a costume for that stayed mostly underwater. There was one that looked more like a child. And there was one that had just weirdly extended arms. Yeah. And he was that one. He was the makeup artist and the suit builder for this. And Daniel Elias Cohen was the boy with the tiki torch. And I have no idea if he is or not, but he has the same last name as one of the people that wrote the story for this movie. Mm. So it's possible that he is related to that person. But who knows? Uh, I enjoyed this tremendously. I would, I would watch it again right now. I watched it earlier today again. <laughs> what do you guys think, uh, Jess? Is this an up or down for you? Uh, this isn't one that I'd tell anybody to go out of their way to watch. So I guess that puts it in the down category. That, that doesn't mean I didn't enjoy it. Yes. it was it was cheesy and fun, but it's uh, it's, it's not on my recommend list. Sure, uh, I'm gonna give it an up. Again, I feel a little biased in that. <laughs> it's like it's like i needed a movie like this right now uh, but i do I, mean, I was sold from the title yeah i i do know enough people who in our circle of friends who would like yeah i totally would recommend this movie to these groups of people to watch yeah it's definitely an up for me for the same reasons it's just uh it's good fun weirdness and it doesn't take itself too seriously we have a shot of a a puppet looking at the monster coming to the tent. We have a shot of people riding a carousel in spite of a severe <laughs> monster attack at the Salmon Festival. I think those alone are reason enough to to give this a, the go-ahead. Jess, where's this going on your letterboxed list? Uh, it's definitely not as high as yours is going to be. Uh, I put this... Um... It's just probably at the top of the bottom third of my list, which is below... Death Ship and above Don't Answer the Phone. Okay. Uh, this is going to be uh, just above Friday the 13th for me. Okay. I would rather watch this than Friday the 13th. Interesting. I'm uh, surprised it's that low for you. Yeah. Uh, which is puts it below a small circle of friends. Okay. For me, I think this goes right above When Time Ran Out, okay. which is just below Caligula. But yeah, I enjoyed this one and uh, and I think you will too. So check it out. I think that's everything we have for this movie. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, or as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show. And if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can support the show through Patreon.com slash VintageVideoPodcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing The Long Riders, which IMDb says is about the origins, exploits, and ultimate fate of the Jesse James gang, told in a sympathetic portrayal of the bank robbers made up of brothers who begin their legendary bank raids because of a revenge. Because of revenge? Yeah, they just revenge. Money. Revenge, Patrick. All right. Well, we'll get to that next week. Anyway, we leave you now with the trailer for The Long Riders. They were nine men. They were four families of brothers. They rode together from Missouri to Minnesota and from Texas to Tennessee. They were the most famous outlaw heroes of the West. They were known as the Long Riders. This is their story, and it's as close to the truth as legends can ever be. 
Now, you don't give us no trouble, mister. I want your sons, Mr. Samuel. What do you want them for? For robbing banks and trains, ma'am. What do you think your chances are of bringing them in? It's an amazingly stupid question. Wait for them to come out. People say they got one of the youngers. People say they got the wrong younger. You men did an excellent job of making heroes out of every one of those gentlemen. I think I'll write me a book. Make myself even more famous than I am. You ever been alone? Excuse me, miss. I was wondering if you cared to dance. I'd be delighted. Coming back for you. We're gonna be meeting up real soon. They got a real fat bank up there. Scouted it out myself. Northfield. You open that safe, mister, you hear? The banker had told us he might be coming. You're robbing the bank! David, Keith, and Robert Carradine is Cole. Jim and Bobby Younger. James and Stacy Keach is Jesse and Frank James. Dennis and Randy Quaid is Clell and Ed Miller. Christopher and Nicholas Guest is the Ford brothers. Riders.